Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the IOP Fellow Laura Washington 7th Seminar as part of the newly formed Child Act series, a program where we're offering issues, concerns, and discussion of candidates, uh, upcoming mayoral elections, platforms, and, and their visions for the city. Elections are starting 26th of February, so we're really excited to have be so close to the date. Laura Washington brings extensive knowledge of Chicago politics and journalism to the IOP. She has served as an editor of the Chicago Reporter, a nationally recognized publication covering race, poverty, and other deputy uh, and, and other race, um, poverty, and other issues concerning to Chicago. Uh, she's also served as the deputy press secretary to Harold Washington, Chicago's first African American mayor. She's currently also a columnist for Chicago Sun Times. We are also delighted to have mayoral candidate Susanna Mendoza joining us this afternoon to discuss her vision for the city of Chicago and why she is running for mayor. Ms. Mendoza has extensive experience in public realm as a former state representative, Chicago city clerk, and a co-chair of Mayor Rahm Emanuel's 2015 re-election campaign. Ms. Mendoza is currently serving as the Illinois Comptroller and continues to play an active role in her community. Today's seminar is on the record, which means you're free to take photos and videos, and there will also be a Q&A section after the end for students to have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, again, thank you all for coming to today's seminar, and let's welcome Laura Washington and Susanna Mendoza. Thank you, Kyle, and welcome, everyone. This is, I think, a record turnout for our, our series so far, so Yay. congratulations, Susanna. Thank you. Uh, you had a, a press conference this morning. Um, yes. Uh, so give us the latest on your campaign. It's a pretty uh, important endorsement. Yeah, today I was endorsed by the Illinois Nurses Association, which is an important organization for me to count on their support, obviously, uh, as a controller for the state of Illinois. And even before that, I used to be a state representative for six terms. Uh, and I was always big on, on nursing issues because, I mean, when do you need a nurse, right? When you're in your, like, most vulnerable state. And the fact that so many of our nurses are overworked, they're understaffed, under-resourced, um, and they just want somebody that will listen to their concerns and try to make a difference about crafting policies that work towards not just making their jobs better, but the healthcare outcomes for the people that they serve better. Because you get into the nursing field because you have a mission to help people, right? It's not about the glamour, um, not, that, not that doctors choose that profession for that, but you know, there's a little bit more of a of a, a, how we see a doctor versus how we see a nurse, but nurses are really the ones that are doing the day-to-day -day work and, and making sure that whether it's you or someone that you love is in the hospital, you always want to make sure that the nurses are not overworked, that they feel that they can perform their mission, and whatever we can do as a government to help that I think is a good thing. Um, I met with them earlier on during the endorsement session uh, in the process to talk about what my vision would be for helping the nurses here in in Chicago. As the state controller, I've been taking on Governor Rauner and his attempts to hurt critical services across the state of Illinois for the last two and a half years has been my job. Actually, the last two years. Now we have a new governor, so hopefully things will be much better. But well, it's interesting uh, you said that's your job because yeah. that's, your job is to is to manage the finances, manage the finances yeah. and take care of the state's books. That's right. But it's kind of... It's turned it, into it, a very so different position, you know. Of, yeah. When I was running for controller, people said, what is a controller? Most people didn't know what a controller was and actually even did a commercial that said, can you say comptroller? Um, because most people would hear me speak and then they'd be like, oh, wow, I had no idea what the controller is supposed to be doing. So um, it is technically the state's chief fiscal officer, right? So it's usually not a super political spot. But there have been controllers in the past that have used it as a bully pulpit when it's necessary to. I mean, Judy Bartopinka is a perfect example. She called out Governor Blagojevich on many instances, and so did uh, controller Dan Hines when he was there. And there was a good phase, maybe like a good four years, that we had Blagojevich that we thought he was good, and then we realized he's not good, and now he's in jail, right? This is how these things happen. But uh, but at the end of the day, uh, controllers here and there have injected themselves into policy because it's important to do that. You're the ones who are managing the state's finances. You're seeing where the dollars go. You're seeing the decisions that the legislature or the governor are making that might negatively impact our finances, and you have a responsibility to call it out. It just had never been as bad as it's been under this last administration. And to give you an example, it took, you know, when we don't pay our bills on time, uh, bills start to accrue late payment interest penalties, kind of like if you didn't pay your credit card on time, right? And it hurts because you're like, ah, this is like the worst. It's stupid debt 
is essentially what it is when you don't pay your bills on time, when you have the ability to do so, right? I mean, sometimes you just can't. But um, the state of Illinois, when we pay late payment interest penalties, they accrue at 1% a month. So essentially, you could be paying up to 12% interest on late payments, which is a dramatically high interest p penalty to pay. And so there's an incentive to try to pay your bills as quickly as possible because we don't want to get to the point where we have to uh, incur late payment interest penalties. That point in Illinois is 90 days past the due date for a bill. So to give you an idea, it took four governors of two different parties, we had two Democrats and two Republicans, and it took 18 and a half years to hit the billion dollar mark, which is a gigantic amount of money, but still 18 years, four governors, and the worst recession to hit Illinois. What do you mean by hitting the billion, 18 billion dollars? To mark? rack up a billion dollars billion worth dollars. of late payment interest penalties, mm -hmm. right? It's a ton of money. Imagine what a billion dollars could go to, mm -hmm. to help services and people. Mm -hmm. but, it, but we did have a massive recession that hit. We had four governors, two different parties, lots of bills, uh, a big $5 billion hole blown in our budget because of the recession. And um, you know a lot of bills didn't get paid on time. But it took 18 years to get there. Mm -hmm. And then it just took two years under Bruce Rauner to exceed, to get to a billion dollars in late payment interest penalties, plus an extra 100 million even more in just two years versus 18, right? And we almost had a complete shutdown of our state government. And so, what did you specifically do other than use your, 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 yeah, other, than, so, other than use your job as a bully pulpit to, to combat that? That's a great question. So I, I came in and I immediately took a look at what we were prioritizing our limited cash flow to. And I realized that just four days before taking office, my predecessor had um, taken $70 million out of what is essentially my liquid pot. We call it the general revenue fund. This is the money that I would use to triage a business that's about to close their doors or something, or a nursing home that is about to miss their payroll. And, in, and I realized that we hadn't paid nursing homes in six months and hospice care in four months, right? No payments to these organizations. They were on the verge of closure. Yet four days before I took office, $70 million had been taken out of that small fund that is my day-to-day -day cash flow um, to pay high-priced consultants who were working on computer projects that hadn't even been delivered yet. And, and I was just so disgusted by it because you're thinking, oh my gosh, these people are literally, you're making life and death decisions and choosing like a very different population than you should be. So first thing I did was set the moral compass for our office for my entire tenure. And that was that we were gonna put people in nursing homes, hospice care, and anyone who is either a child or an adult with disability or cares for children or adults with disabilities at the front of the line. And then we were gonna focus on, on education. First. They get paid before anybody else gets paid. Mm -hmm. Because really, it's the most vulnerable amongst us. And I think that if we don't do anything else right as a government, we should start by taking care of the most vulnerable amongst us. And an example of that is, you know, these are people that are never going to vote for me, right? That's not why you're prioritizing these populations. You're prioritizing them because you have to have a heart in government. And people who are so sick that they can't clean themselves, they can't eat for themselves, and by definition can't even speak for themselves, right? Like they need somebody who's going to be doing that for them. So for me, you know, I don't care about anything else. Like the most vulnerable come first, and then we figure it out from there. So it was about triaging the state triaging through this period of time in which I, as the state's chief fiscal officer, was not legally allowed to pay any bills because no budget had been passed. For three full years, the governor did not pass a budget. In 736 days, I had no legal authority to pay the bills outside of what the courts had determined was something that I was allowed to pay. So never before in the history of our state were the courts literally managing our finances, but it got so bad in Illinois that people started suing the government and then if they won their case in court, then the judge would say, okay, you have to pay this bill. Right. But I only had to pay like a, a bare legal minimum. So it's been, it, it, this became like a moral imperative for me to, to tell the story of what was happening to Illinois' finances, uh, but most importantly to tell the story of what was happening to the people impacted by those finances because it's not just a number on a spreadsheet, sure. right? Those sure. numbers tell a story And like you people. say, it's the most vulnerable people in the, in yeah. the, in the state. So. Fast forward to you're running for mayor. How to translate that experience into and explain how that quali helps qualify you to, to be the mayor of Chicago, particularly in this, this very tough, challenging financial times that we're in the city? Yeah, great question, Laura. So, one of the things that I did was champion a bonding deal for the state of Illinois that would allow us to go to the market with general obligation bonds, $6 billion worth of them. We had a $16.7 billion backlog of unpaid bills for services that had been rendered, right? 
and uh, and I said we've got to pay these bills. So once we passed a budget, as part of the budget, I worked very hard to include a six billion dollar bonding authority because I just explained how we were paying 12 percent interest on late payments, right? We had racked up 16.7 billion dollars of late payments, and so imagine the interest payments that we were accruing on that. It hit over a billion dollars. So I said in order to get the closest thing to an economic stimulus at this point would be to start paying down these bills. So we did a bonding deal that uh, the governor fought me on, but eventually we essentially shamed him into doing it. But it was great business for Illinois because we were able to take $6 billion, uh, bless you, whoever sneezed, um, and uh, bond that out. And then I was able to leverage federal matching dollars on those $6 billion, depending on how I spent them. So we turned $6 billion into $9 billion. And then we put that directly into the market for all, a lot of the bills that had not been paid. That's how we were able to cut down our bill backlog from close to 17 to what is today about 7.2. Most importantly, it was literally a lifeline to businesses that were on the verge of closing. And many businesses did close prior to the ability to get access to those dollars. And so, uh, you know, navigating the state through that, being able to lead the charge on financial tools that we had to employ and essentially force the governor's hand into doing it by talking to editorial boards across the state of Illinois, making the case for why this was good governance. Um, and the best part about that deal is that we saved taxpayers four to six billion dollars over the course of the 12 years that we'll be paying these bonds because we were paying 12 percent interest and now we're only paying three and a half percent on that 16, 17 billion dollars. So I've got the experience to know how to employ financial tools to the benefit of, you know, Illinoisans. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that I've done managing the state through the worst fiscal crisis in its history. Most importantly, giving the markets calm at a time when most people thought that would be impossible. And the governor took us through eight credit downgrades and we're on the brink of junk bond territory. And it wasn't until I got involved and, and really like tried to stabilize, uh, did stabilize our state's finances, that the markets responded favorably to that. So I feel we're in a much better position today than we were just, you know, even six months ago. So, but, so what is but your that's plan for what Chicago, I, I would what is say your plan that, for Chicago going yeah, forward? Okay. What is your financial plan? So we have, we're we going to be going crisis. into, we have, we, yep. we we're have gonna economic be going, development challenges. Yeah, we have a lot of challenges. Yeah. But again, nothing that, nothing that we can't overcome together. Okay. I truly feel that. And so I feel like I have the financial acumen, mm -hmm. right, to walk into the city of Chicago, the third largest city, knowing that we're probably going into some tough economic challenges ahead. Uh, but those challenges don't scare me, frankly. I mean, I feel like that's my sweet spot. I understand how to use economic tools and put them to work. Um, the more challenging stuff is going to be the social things, right? Like, how do we deal with, you know, police and community relations and heal that relationship? That is, like, the major challenge for the next mayor. So, so let's talk about that. What is your plan? Yeah. What is your agenda? Sure. For example, do, do you, will you retain Eddie Johnson? What is your view on how what kind of job he's been doing and, and, and the consent decree? How will you implement that? And what, yeah. are, what other issues are on the table for you? So let's start with uh, Eddie Johnson. So I'm not making any policy decisions until I'm mayor. I don't think that's responsible. But what I would say about Eddie Johnson is while there may or may not be a new superintendent, I think it's irresponsible for any candidate right now to be saying that we should we should get rid of Eddie Johnson or fire Eddie Johnson upon becoming mayor because let's just look at the calendar. Uh, the next mayor will take office in May. That's the beginning of what is the deadliest season in our city. And the last thing that we can afford to do right now is to have a major uh, turmoil or a change in the superintendent's position when we've got to make sure that our streets are as safe as possible and that we have a plan in place and that there's some stability going into that transition. That's certainly not saying that I won't be making changes. I just think that we but shouldn't you're, be you're politicizing. Yeah, we shouldn't be politicizing the superintendent's job right now at this point, especially knowing that we're going into one of the most dangerous seasons for us, which is the end of the school year and the beginning of the summer. So, but um, we, we can't wait until May for a plan. So, what is your vision? Yeah. Your so then, plan for, in terms for of dealing with policing, policing, though, whoever the superintendent is that I do mm -hmm. hire uh, or keep, will have to share my vision that number one, we have to implement the consent decree. No questions about that. It has to be done. Uh, number two. I think that we have to better train and resource our police officers. And anybody who says that we don't need to invest in training for police officers is just not being honest with you. There's no way that you can expect a 12,000 man force to just put on a uniform, give them the sign of the cross, and a few weeks of training in the academy and hope that the outcomes are going to be ones that we can be proud of and consistently proud of. So we have to better train and resource them. Uh, Laquan McDonald, I mean, let's look at what happened there. 
the police department was waiting for far too long for a taser. We only have 500 tasers in the city of Chicago. New York City has 15,000, right? That's just not acceptable. So we do need to better train and resource our officers. Uh, we need more detectives, and that would mean promoting folks up from the ranks to the detective divisions because we have a 15% clearance rate on solving crimes. It's the worst in the country. And so when one crime goes unsolved, it turns into three, five, ten, right? So we've got to get a better grip on that. But we most importantly, I would say, have to understand that we need to attack the root causes of violence. Why does violence even exist? So you can have all the police in the world, but if you're not changing the the reasons why people choose to pick up a gun instead of a book or a gun instead of a wrench, then you're not really fixing much of anything. So I've put forth plans to invest in neighborhoods that have been disinvested in historically. I mean, our city is the most segregated city in America, and that's not by accident. It was immorally by design, right? It was by design. This didn't happen by itself. And so if we're looking about changing outcomes and fixing, correcting those wrongs, then you have to be just as intentional about where you're going to spend limited resources in trying to get positive outcomes. And I think that whatever investments we make as a city have to be viewed through a racial equity lens, right? We have to correct the wrongs, and we're not going to wait another 20 or 30 years to do that. What do you mean by... The west side, the south side have historically been disenfranchised. They're socio and economically depressed. Um, and they're African American. They're African American and primarily, mm -hmm. yep. And if you think about the fact that our public transportation system, for example, we have transportation deserts in the west and the south side of the city of Chicago, where there used to be um, where there used to be uh, like Cabrini Green, a public housing, right? Mm -hmm. There, it was intentional that they didn't put CTA L, L stops there, mm -hmm. because they didn't want those folks, you know, meddling with the working class. Mm -hmm. And so you wonder why people don't have access to jobs, why people, and then we blame them for not working, right? It's just not right. So you have to, you have to address the inequalities that have been ingrained in our city for many, many years. Um, I love the diversity of our city, but it shouldn't be so segregated. And so we have to, I, I rolled out a transportation plan just the other day that talks about how nobody should have to walk more than 10 minutes to access all day public transportation, whether that's a bus or it's an L or it's a last mile connector, whether it's a scooter or a divvy bike or whatever to get you from your home to the closest you know, bus stop or train stop. And so these are all things that will help connect our city. Um, if we don't have manufacturing plants popping up overnight on the west and the south side, Laura, we still need to make sure that the people that live in those communities have easy access to jobs that are in other parts of the city, whether it's downtown or anywhere else. So there's a lot of investment that has to happen, but it really needs to be in human capital. And I think if we're investing in children and we're investing not giving up on their parents, even if it's just one parent, the point of the matter is that um, those parents today that are struggling with their own life outcomes that maybe made bad decisions that have been in and out of the correctional facility, um, it's because the, you know, the prior generations gave up on that generation. As mayor, I'm not going to give up on anybody. I believe that everybody is redeemable. And if you've had problems with the law, well, then we need to invest in reentry programs like the Safer Foundation that I've been working very closely with as controller and trying to prioritize dollars there, especially during the crisis, because as our citizens reenter society, if we're not investing in their ability to become productive members of society, then they're going to reenter the system again at a very expensive cost, $40,000 a year to incarcerate someone. I mean, that's more than most college tuitions. And we can invest that money in a way that produces a positive outcome instead of, you know, just this continual cycle of recurring violence. And the children are also a, a key thing. Now, you see up there on that board, it talks about remake the city's 50 most under-enrolled and underutilized schools into community hubs with wraparound services. This is like one of my most exciting initiatives. It's called the 50 New Initiative. And instead of closing the next 50 schools or talking about that, I'm going to double down the equity dollars that we achieved through very hard work over the last two years in Springfield to finally get some more dollars that are supposed to be spent where they're most needed in the what, school funding what is formula. Out of money. Seventy million dollars for the city available. of Chicago for lower income, yeah, it, needy communities. And yeah, for communities that are under-resourced, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So the challenges like that you'll have in, in Austin are going to be significantly higher than you do in Lincoln Park. So if you give you know, $10,000 per kid to each school, I mean, you, you need to put a lot more than $10,000 to just get them up to where they need to be and close the achievement gap, which is what this is all about in some of these under-resourced 
and more challenged communities. So we just need to be cognizant of that. And so what I want to do is take some of those $70 million and invest them in 50 of the most underutilized, under-enrolled schools. And what does that mean? We've got some schools that the population uh, loss has been so severe on some of the west and south sides of the city. For obvious reasons, a lot of times it's no economic opportunity or tough schools or violence, which is the reason why my family left my community of Little Village when I was seven. There was a murder on our block and my parents just freaked out and said, that's enough, right? But and, I mean, and, I, and, and, and you moved out of the city. We moved out, of the city, moved out of the city and we moved to the suburbs and we were able to know what it was like. I was able to the first time in my life know what it was like to play outside of my house, right? I could never play outside of my house as a little kid. I was only allowed to play in the backyard. And it was a whole year before, and I want to get back to this mm -hmm. 50 new, but it was a whole year before my mom even let me and my brothers play outside of our house in the suburbs. And it was straight up like Pleasantville. It was so nice. Which, like which, which suburb Woodridge, was Illinois. Mm -hmm. We were like the first Mexican family out there. I think if I write a book about Woodridge, we probably were the first Mexican family out there. I never <laughs> met one while I was out there. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I learned to ride my bike. I learned to play out, outside of my house. To, I know what it's like to like come into my house when the lights go on, right? And in the city, there's just too many kids where the lights go out for them because they're just playing. They're just trying to be kids, and that's not okay. So my experience was that I always felt like I was run out of my neighborhood by gangs. Mm -hmm. And I was passionately like aware of that my whole life. And so I knew that someday I was going to graduate college. College wasn't an option for me because I felt like I had to succeed because of the sacrifices that my parents were making. They were poor. They had multiple jobs. They borrowed money from friends to make the rent or the mortgage, right? Uh, but they did what they had to do to give us a safe environment mm -hmm. and access to a good public school. And those two things made a major difference in my life. And that's why I can run for mayor today. But I, I know the difference between being scared to walk to school every day and walking back home and then having a normal childhood. And that's an experience that's going to help me be a better mayor because, you know, I know what's possible for people. And I also know what people don't think is possible for them because unlike my parents, they weren't able to leave. So as mayor, I want to fight for those families too. So getting back to 50 new. I'll give you an example of what we're talking about with one of these schools. We're going to target 50 of the most under-enrolled and under-utilized, under-resourced schools in the 50 most, in areas that are high violence and high poverty. And so in some of these schools, for example, there'll be 100 kids. But there's like two-thirds of the footprint is vacant. I mean, maybe it's a school for 100, it has 100 kids in it today, but it's a school that's meant for 2,000 kids. Mm -hmm. So on paper, you could say, well, it makes financial sense to close it. But I think when you close the neighborhood school, you're giving up on that community, and that's the message that you're sending. So what I want to do is we'll take some of those equity dollars, we'll double down on those children, but instead of saying, well, there's all this empty space in the building, we should just close it, we're going to fill up that space. But we're going to fill it up with wraparound services from social service providers that offer a very passionate service in their own communities. But if you're a parent who doesn't even know where to get started, and improving your life outcome, right? It's a scary thing to even ask for help or to go seek it. And most importantly, you guys aren't parents yet, but let me just tell you that as a mother of a child in the CPS system, which I'm a new mom of a child in the CPS system, he's a kindergartner, so he's just getting started. This is when like life punches you in the face and you're like, whoa, hold on, I have to pick up my kid at 315? Like, who can do that? Most people actually can't do that. And so I started asking questions like, how come no one even talks about this? It's just the way it is, and everyone's used to it, and you have to figure it out. But if you're a parent like us, yeah. we can figure so it out. So you're going to, so, so the, you, to address the parental yeah. needs, you're going to build some wraparound yeah, services. Yeah, we're going to build wraparound these, services. Things like life skills coaching, mm -hmm. uh, job training, job placement services. We'll even have like day labor agencies partner with us because not everyone's ready for a nine to five job, but they might want to just figure out how to get into the market. And then we'll have a job placement service there too to help once they've gone through the life skills coaching or the job skills training to be able to put people into jobs, place them into jobs, the parents, right? Uh, safer foundation type services, which are rep, you know also uh, re-entry type uh, initiatives. So we're working with the whole family and not just the children, a daycare provider service in there so that while mom or dad are trying to access these wraparound services, they don't have to worry about who's going to you know, watch their little kid who's not necessarily enrolled in that school. And most importantly, the children are going to have a, uh, an environment that's safe in which they'll be able to stay for a longer part of the day. We'll provide supper to them. I'm the state legislator who many years ago passed the school breakfast bill in Illinois, which that's why all kids in CPS schools get, or in any Illinois school for that matter, uh, get free school breakfast. So we can do the same. We can leverage federal dollars the way I did for breakfast and 
bring that into these schools and make sure that the kids who are in high hunger and security communities um, get access to dinner. And in the meantime, while they're getting tutoring and after school mentoring opportunities, their parents are accessing services that otherwise would be pretty hard, if not impossible, for them to do on their own. This is sounding really expensive, and you mentioned the $70 million yeah, yeah, yeah. you're going to pull from the state funding, but it's yeah. where else? It's going to cost a lot more to, to do it does. this 50 institutions. Well, it's 50, so I, I don't know that it, uh, first of all, I don't even think we need to use all 70 because mm -hmm. I'm going to target private businesses and philanthropic people, and Chicago is a special place. We have a wonderful, vibrant philanthropic community who wants to invest in innovation and cool new ideas that are have measurable outcomes. So you're going to bring those kinds of yes, institutions in as for partners sure, to for help, sure. help resources. Yes, but also I'd, I'd say this. Look, the one cool thing about being controller of the state of Illinois is that I see where the money goes. And I see that $40,000 goes today, right now, towards incarcerating somebody that if we just invest a fraction of that, we can have a positive outcome. And they go from being in a jail producing no revenue for the state of Illinois to actually having a life and having a productive one where they feel that they matter and now they have a job and now they're contributing to the tax base instead of taking from it, right? So I would argue, Laura, for everybody who says that's so expensive is, yeah, it is expensive to keep incarcerating people who we could actually reform. And we're paying for that now. We're just paying for it in a different bucket, right? So as a controller of the state of Illinois, I get to talk about return on investment for each one of your taxpayer dollars. And for people who will say to me, because they tell me all the time, you'd be surprised. Well, I don't want my money going, uh, this, these are not my words, but there's, I don't want my money going to a junkie when we talk about substance abuse mm -hmm. programs, right? And, and I'll say, well, wow, okay, uh, but let me educate you on this because your money is going to a junkie, right? Would you rather I take a dollar out of your pocket when you're watching and put it towards substance abuse treatment that could have a positive outcome and we can actually uh, look at a person as this is a health issue and not a crime issue? Or would you rather I take 14 when you're not because that's what we're doing right now is just going to the correctional facility side or $8 to the emergency facility side for overdoses and things like that. So, you know, even if the person falls off the bandwagon or, or you know, falls off the wagon, I should say, and, you know, gets back into drug usage, we still have a whole bunch of tries before we're even breaking even on what we're wasting in the first try on the correctional side of things. So it's important to tell the story about return on investment of taxpayer dollars. And I've had that experience. So you can better believe that as mayor, I'm going to try to take the limited resources that we have mm -hmm. and put them in areas where they'll will produce. They'll produce for taxpayers in a way that brings down the, the violence that we see every day in our neighborhoods and actually produces a greater tax base that ends up helping the whole city. And one thing I'd really love to see, Laura, is that years from now, people say, you remember when everybody was leaving the city of Chicago? We couldn't keep talented graduates from University of Chicago here. They were going to... Um, San Francisco or New York, none of you better do that. I'm just saying right now, I'll find out where you live and keep you here. <laughs> but, uh, but my point is, I want to be the mayor that changed that direction, right? The, the narrative is going to be not of people leaving Chicago, but people can't wait to get to Chicago and stay in Chicago because we are the greatest city in the world. And while we do have a lot of, a lot of issues and challenges, like I said, we can overcome all of them. They all have a solution, but you need a mayor who's going to be energetic, who is focused, laser focused, frankly, and who has the experience to be able to lead this city at this time, which is when we're at a real crossroads. That touches on something that you've said a lot on the campaign trail, and that's that, that, you, that Chicago doesn't need a caretaker mm -hmm. mayor, that needs a mayor that's focused on the next generation, to paraphrase what you've said over yeah. and over again. What does that mean? And is, that sounds like that's aimed at maybe some, some of the older uh, candidates in the race who, who, uh, who are some of your chief competitors, like Tony Brackwinkle mm -hmm. and Bill Daly. Well, it means that, again, that I, I truly believe that in order to be the mayor of Chicago in a way that would be transformational, you need to be here for more than four years. And while I do believe in term limits for the mayor, I do believe that you need a level of energy and intensity and passion that, frankly, I don't see in a lot of the other candidates. And the caretaker reference is to this. A lot of you guys are too young to remember any of this, but Laura would. You're young, too, I'm just saying. I'm done. I didn't mean it that way. Okay. But what I meant was like me, I remember this very clearly, um, and I'm 46. When I was a kid, uh, and I'd get to come to visit my mom at her work, maybe on a day where there was no school or something for a teacher conference or something. It was always exciting, right? She worked at Continental Bank. It was one of many jobs that she had. And uh, it was right on the, in the loop, right downtown, down the street from City Hall. 
And it was always fun, but then at five o'clock when she was done, it was a ghost town. I mean, everybody was leaving the city of Chicago. And then as I got older and I was a young lady, uh, like in college even, um, I'd come down to what is today Millennium Park that all of you know and probably love and enjoy in the summer, but it was like an old abandoned rail yard. And it was sketchy, it really was sketchy. You never felt safe there walking by yourself as a young lady. And then Mayor Daley came along. And Mayor Daley truly transformed the downtown of Chicago. It is the global version of what people think about if they don't live here and they are coming from London and they come to Chicago and they're like, wow, what an amazing, marvelous city. But they're pretty much you know, stationed downtown. So this is their image of Chicago. But it wasn't always like that. Like I said, it was pretty sketchy. And so he had this transformational vision, which was to create the museum campus. When I was a little kid, we'd go to the museum campus every weekend because it's how my parents kept us safe. They'd take us there and we'd learn things and we weren't exposed to gun violence. But we had to go through an underpass to get from one museum to the other. And those underpasses were kind of sketchy. But it was cool, whatever. Uh, but Mayor Daly said, we're going to get rid of that. We're going to connect the museums together so that it's like a place where all families can go. And it's not just getting in the building, but enjoying the skyline and the parks and all this stuff. And he did so by moving Lakeshore Drive. He literally moved Lakeshore Drive to the other side. And a lot of people complained about it. They said, we don't need to do this. It's a total waste of dollars, blah, blah, blah. He didn't care because he had this transformational vision. And then the same thing with Millennium Park. Most of that was paid by private dollars, yet still taxpayers complained all the time, well, it right? Was, it, it cost a lot more than he originally it did. promised it would, too. But think about how much money we've made from tourism sure, as a result sure. of that investment at sure, that time. Sure, so, so right? you're suggesting that you're going to bring that a similar I want to be vision? transformational, yeah. I want to do things that people might challenge and say that that's not necessary. Investments on the west and the south side um, that people would say, why are we doing that? There's, mm -hmm. We've got to be so cost conscious. I think we do need to be cost conscious, but we also have to have a transformational vision for this city and a caretaker mayor isn't going to do that and the reason I say that is because Mayor Daley while he did Millennium Park while he did Navy Pier while he did the museum campus that was during his transformational stage well, he was in office for 21 years that's right but the last and right Maybe I'm not saying I can do long. all those things right or, but uh, the last it, four it, to six yeah. years though mm -hmm. the last four to six years mm -hmm. he was a caretaker mayor mm -hmm. he didn't deal with police reform he didn't deal with pension payments that were you know necessary he didn't deal with all of a sudden the downturn in the communities because of the lack of investment in neighborhoods that all stopped in those last four to six years and there were lots of reasons I mean Maggie got sick and maybe he just didn't have the fire in the belly anymore he had been there too long but the point of the matter is is that we cannot afford another caretakership mayor because what did we do he sold the parking meters the Skyway, like all the easy decisions that have long-lasting nev negative implications so why, why happen during so that sure time. So you said you think most of your, your, your opponents are in that category. They're not, they're not Richard M. Daley. What, what they're do you, not, but where I think do you get, where do you get the impression or what's the evidence that they're going to be caretaker mayors? I, I think that, um, for example, President Preckwinkle has already said she would only serve one term, right? And I don't think you can be transform. I know you cannot be transformational um, in one term. It's not possible. What about Bill Daly? And Bill Daly, you know, when the they asked him of why, the guy who when did they all these exactly, and the brother who advised the mayor during his key caretakership years. I mean, Bill Daly is the one who advised Mayor Daly to sell the parking meters, and his son made, you know, and his son's company made two point eight million dollars off of that deal. I think it was a great deal, as he says, for the. Well, no, I should say this. Bill Daly, just as early as May, said that this was a great deal for Chicago. I would argue it was a great deal for the dailies. It was a pretty catastrophic deal for Chicagoans. And again, you know, while I was busy fighting Bruce Rauner off for the last two and a half years, Bill Daly was the chairman of his transition committee. And, you know, that might have been okay if you were trying to be bipartisan, right? Well, I get that's that. What he says. He I get says that. It, but yeah. but what was not okay is that during that whole seven hundred and thirty six day budget impasse, not once did he critique what was happening, and he was a part of that initial rollout. So even Jim Edgar, who's a Republican, who was a co-chair as well, said, this is devastating. This needs to stop. I mean, Governor Rauner is just terrible for Illinois, essentially, as, as close as he got to saying that. He was outspoken against what he was doing to our state. Yet Bill Daley, who today wants us to trust him on these decisions, is, you know, he's not a transformational mayor. And he actually said when they asked him, why do you want to be mayor? 
He said, because I think it'd be really cool. That's not why anybody should be running for mayor. I get it that, you well, know. Well, that could be part of it. Maybe this is. <laughs> that could be one reason. First of all, being mayor of Chicago yeah. is no prize. Yeah. Let me just be it's honest tough. about that. That's why Rahm, yeah, it's that's no why Rahm prize. is quitting. And nobody, nobody should be thinking, I want to run for mayor because I think it's going to be so cool. Or, as Tony Preckwinkle said, I'm running for mayor because I can that's like the worst reason to run for mayor. You should be running for mayor because, again, the city's future is at stake, and we need to focus on the next generation, not just the next four years, or more importantly, on us. I'm not running for mayor to be something. I'm running for mayor to do something, and that is the key differentiator here. I'm, I'm not focused, like I said, on you know me or the next four years. This is about what can I do, what kind of legacy can I leave behind. The daughter of Mexican immigrants who, oh my God, I have this chance right now to legitimately run for mayor and win the mayoralty. It, it's not about me. It's about not squandering that opportunity and what you could do as your legacy for the future generation and the generation after that. And that's the kind of mayor that I want to be. I want to be the mayor that 20, 30 years from now, somebody shares a story similar to what I just said about Rich Daly during the transformational years, and there is no caretakership in my mayoralty. It's going to be all about getting stuff done. It's what I've done as a state rep. Mm -hmm. It's what I've done as city clerk, transforming that office to an office that actually works for people, um, where you don't have to waste three hours in line to buy a city sticker that nobody wants to pay for. You can do it five, ten minutes. Do it in the buff on your computer at home, whatever. <laughs> but the point is, we make it easy. We make it easy. Okay. And that's how government should work. It should work for people, not make your life more complicated. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of complications, uh, right. this campaign has seen some, particularly around public corruption, out of the blue. This yeah. Ed Burke in investigation has it's tied tied him up, tied up Danny Solis. Uh, Alderman Marino now is mm -hmm. involved, and, and probably going to tie up more. And these are and these are all allies, close associates of yours. Yeah. Uh, you're not the only one who has. Sure. There's the, the, probably the, the four leading candidates all have associations with these folks in one way or the other. So wh why should voters trust you? Why should voters not be uh, concerned about the, these very close ties you have with folks who've been sure. involved with corruption? I know, I know you've given yeah. money back, you've, you've right. denounced this, but these are folks that you go way back with and, and, and two of them you yeah. have been mentors of yours. So one of, one of them has, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. all um, right. So anyway, uh, it's a good question, right? I think it's a fair question. People should have confidence in who their government leaders are. Um, I'm a little bit at a disadvantage in that I'm running for mayor and I represented the southwest side of the city of Chicago, which is where two of those aldermen actually represented, right? So just put this in perspective. As the state representative, your job is to work closely with the local aldermen in your district. There's no way I can divorce myself from that, nor do I pretend to. So my close relationships with aldermen should be an expectation of whoever you vote for as your when, representative. But even when they're corrupt? No, but I've called it out, right? Mm -hmm. So like the second that anything is put out there that is nefarious in any way, shape, or form, if I was supporting and championing them and protecting them, that would be one thing. Mm -hmm. But I've been absolutely condemning that behavior. And I can't, I'm not their keeper, right? I don't know what they're doing when I'm not around. Obviously, when I'm at public events or I'm working on legislation that improves <laughs> outcomes for the communities that they represent and that I represent, that should be what you expect me to do. And so those are the relationships that I've had. But, well, but, so, it's, so, but no matter who, like at the end yeah. of the day, look, I, not only was I a state rep, I was the city clerk of Chicago, which means by definition that my job is to work with all 50 aldermen. So any one of these guys that gets in trouble, I guarantee you there will probably be a picture of me with them or there will be something that I worked on with them, uh, some positive relationship because that's the job. It's to try to get along with your colleagues and work with them towards a goal. But what they do... On the, the negative side of things, that's a reflection on their actions, certainly not my ethical code of conduct, and I've condemned it as forcefully as humanly possible the second anything has come up. But unlike many of the other candidates who haven't been in the positions that I have where they have to interact so closely with elected officials all the time, you know, they can say, oh, I don't have anything to do with that. But, you know, any anytime you get elected to office, your job is to work with your colleagues. And, you know, it's, it's an unfair disadvantage for me because no matter what, we're in political season, which is silly season, and so whoever next goofball does something stupid, they're going to try to say, like, you know, they're my best friend. So at the end of the day, um, I know who I am. I sleep very well at night. I've always conducted myself to the highest levels of integrity. And while I did not have to give those dollars back because they weren't illegal, they were totally legal, and, and, and I reported you, them. How much did you give back? 114550 which were all the contributions that were even, like, talked about. Mm -hmm. And mine, unlike President Preckwinkle's, that is part of a criminal federal investigation, 
uh, mine were all done legally and they were reported and transparent fully. But I, you know, my integrity doesn't have a price tag. So I felt like the right thing to do was given that these people had done things that I believe, you know, while there's still due process and they haven't been convicted of anything, I think that there's enough out there to make me feel that they're probably going to be and mm -hmm. they should be, um, that I don't want any part of that. And so, you know, it's not fair to say, oh, she received a contribution 10 years ago or even two years ago when I didn't know anything that was going on and say that that ties me to their behavior. That's just ridiculous. Well, then why not just defend the, 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 the contributions and keep them if, if you feel like everything was legal and above board and there so, were no So, again, it's like, you know, no good deed goes unpunished, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I just feel like, to me, I could put those dollars to better use, mm -hmm. right? So I donated all of that money to the Montford uh, Point Marines who were on the verge of losing their building, and this was the first African-American Marine unit uh, to ever serve. Uh, and they happen to be from Inglewood, right? So it's such a cool story. And uh, and I guess I could have, but I just felt like I don't need that money more than I need folks to understand that I'm always going to do the right thing. And I felt that doing the right thing was just getting rid of anything that even remotely could, could give anyone an opportunity to think differently of me. That's not who I am. So I do think that, you know, President Preckwinkle should have returned the money and not waited until after the election and proven that she returned the money or donated it, I should say. But... You know, everybody's free to do whatever they want to do. I've always conducted myself with nothing but integrity and, and you know, it's what you have to do. I mean, it is what it is, you know, and, uh, and well, I'm, it, I, but it, most it importantly, has, though, has, I would say that. Changed, would you say it's changed the tenor of the campaign? And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I people are sick and tired of candidates corruption. Candidates are having harder and harder time raising money. The endorsements are coming in more slowly, perhaps, than they would because uh, voters and folks who are supporting these candidates are hesitant. Yeah. They don't know where the next indictment's going to Come, come out of and who, yeah, who else is going to get Yeah, I don't know about that, Laura. I don't think that I've, I haven't really pursued endorsements from elected mm -hmm. officials. I feel like right now, you don't, know, that wasn't mine. It wasn't actually mine. When they mm -hmm. asked me the question yesterday, I didn't even know what they were talking about, mm -hmm. which you could kind of see that in my face. So, uh, the question what? The, the fundraiser? Which one are you talking about? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I was talking about your fundraising in general. Oh, my fundraising. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, we just got another $100,000 contribution. It's tough. It's tough to be out there raising money when there's 14 candidates in a race and no mm -hmm. one knows. It's more about the issue of who's going to be in the top three, right? So there's limited dollars. It's easy for people to say, we're just going to wait this out and see what happens in the runoff, and then everyone's going to want to engage. But <coughs> you've got to get out there and make your case, you know, and not everybody is able to raise big money like that. I'm pretty good at raising money, but clearly, you know, Bill Daly with a daily name is going to have an easier time raising money. And President Preckwinkle has raised the bulk of her candidacy from, or her fundraising from like three entities, right? So it's not like she's got this widespread uh, group of fundraising going on. But it just is what it is. Everybody focuses on their own race. I'm not worried about what the other candidates are doing because, frankly, I'm not running against the other candidates. I'm running for Chicago. Well, of course you like, are. Of no, course not, you no, are. Not. They're running. <laughs> I'm running my race. I, 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 see, I see who you hit on. Yeah. You hit you hit Daly. You hit Preckwinkle. You hit the folks that are perceived as being among the front run runners, and you're, yeah. in, and you're in that group. I, I don't think see it's you, just speaking I don't the see truth, you criticizing right? Amara Enya, for I like example. Amara Enya. She just had a, she, she had a bad week dead, this week with her with with revelations about her. You know what? Her here's not here's the thing about Amara. Like, and with that bad week, let's mm -hmm. talk about that because do you know why Amara had a bad week? Mm -hmm. It was unfair. It was unfair that she had a bad week. They gave her a bad week because they said that she's had trouble financially, right? And that how can she run the city or its finances when she's had her own financial troubles, mm -hmm. right? Number one, peddling that story, I think, is, you know, kind of cheap. And we certainly didn't peddle it. Um, who but did? I believe that President Preckwinkle peddled that story. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of people who, you know, the reporters, they mm -hmm. talk, right? They, they don't necessarily divulge their sources, but mm -hmm. they you know the where that came and from. Pitched the pitched yeah, the exactly. So, okay. but the point of the matter is, is look, the only reason we even know about Amara's finances and mm -hmm. her personal troubles, which are, I think, a lot of people could relate to, right? Mm -hmm. How many kids here probably struggle with your student loans? Can I get it, a show of hands? Right? <laughs> Nobody? Yeah. But, yeah. And it's hard. It's hard. And then if you're a person of color, mm -hmm. even harder, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, people ask me, are you good with money? And I'm like, yeah, but I'm even better when there's no money because mm -hmm. my parents never had any and you learn how to stretch a dollar, mm -hmm. right? And you have to make choices. And people every day in the city make choices between food or rent or their kids' medical bills, and that's nothing to be ashamed about. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the only reason we even know and can critique her finances are because she did the right thing and put forward returns. her tax returns. Mm -hmm. Whereas you've got Gary Chico and Bill Daly who refuse to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, two millionaires in this race 
who refuse to come clean with the public about their tax returns. And maybe it wouldn't be so bad if Gary Chico, uh, when he ran for mayor the first time, hadn't tried to shame Carol Mosley Braun, an African American woman, into releasing her full tax returns. At that time, saying that this was all about transparency. And if you don't have anything to hide, well, then you should just put them out there. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, you know, in this election, no, he doesn't feel that he needs to share his or release his tax return. So that's just hypocrisy at its best. Okay. And so I don't think it's fair to, I, you can critique Amara, but I wouldn't say she had a bad week. She had a week where she could talk about her story, mm -hmm. where she could say that, look, I, I don't, I'm not a millionaire. Uh, she's got five degrees, I think, and maybe more. And, uh, and you know, she could probably be making a ton of money working in the private sector. And but clearly she you don't see there. her as a political threat. No, no, <laughs> you know what, I, and that's not true. Like, that's not true. I, I think Amara's got a bright future, and mm -hmm. maybe she is. I don't think anybody in this race right now mm -hmm. can claim that they've got a guaranteed spot into that I runoff. Would agree. I would what agree I, with What that. I am saying, though, is that I think I'm, I'm confident enough in my ability to not have to try to smack down mm -hmm. another person who has a potentially good voice in this race. And I've, I've not smacked down Lori, who I also think is a fierce, a fierce candidate. And I, I haven't even smacked down Paul or anybody else for that matter. I'm smacking down the people who I think have taken advantage of their positions. Like when Tony Preckwinkle challenged my petitions and challenged Lori Lightfoot's petitions and only challenged the petitions of women of color, and she's the highest ranking woman of color who is the boss of the party bosses today and calls herself a progressive. I mean, look, I'm going to call that out because there's nothing progressive about that. That is just old school machine politics trying to keep, you know, dissenting voices or even just additional voices from being heard. And I don't think that Chicagoans deserve to have a mayor who's going to self-coronate herself. I think you guys should have a choice as to who your candidates are. Now, okay. I hope you vote for me. I think Amara's cool, but no, don't no. vote for her, even though I said all these great things about her. <laughs> vote for me. But my point is, I'm all not right. scared of other talented people in the race. Got you. I want yeah. to open, open it up to, yes, you go right ahead. Uh, congratulations for running for mayor. And, Thank you. Um, I hope you get elected. Oh, I hope and, so, too. Uh, Ford just announced that they will invest a billion in Chicago if you become mayor. So <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> what did you say? I'm oh, saying Ford. <laughs> Ford, yeah, Ford, Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company is yeah. going to invest a billion dollars. Oh, yeah. did they say if I become mayor, they'll invest a billion? No, 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 no. no. Next I hope so. Yeah. 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 You'll be yeah, in yeah. charge of it. You invest a billion, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wanted to, because I, um, I come from Zimbabwe and we have, um, uh, you know, we, we, we have a history where, you know, candidates get into office and one of their, um, promises that they would deal with corruption and deal with it and deal with it. So I just wanted to ask, because I really believe that from everything that you have said, you really have a great plan and a solid plan, and it's always good to have a candidate who has got mm -hmm. a good financial background. But I, I, I really believe that uh, one of the things that might be a bigger challenge for you, other than the other challenges you believe in, uh, is corruption, because it's systematic. And um, so what's your it's, question? yeah, so what I want to understand do? how like uh, she wants to do with that. I, I think maybe okay. I Thank you. So, get yeah, for we've yes, been for corruption. corruption. Yeah. So if you go to my website, it's called uh, well, SusannaMendoza.com, so please check it out. And we, we call it our Future Now Plan, and we touch a whole bunch of different issues. But out of all of the candidates running for mayor today, I can say confidently that I have the most comprehensive anti-corruption ethics and accountability plan out there. Um, the, the key differentiator between mine and what the other candidates have, a lot of us have similar ideas on what we want to do, uh, but the key thing is that the minute I get sworn in, the very first official act that I will take as mayor is establishing an anti-corruption ethics and accountability commission, not a task force, an actual commission. And so today when you guys go home and you're like Googling, you can even Google it now, you should Google Operation Greylord. Okay? It was a huge corruption, the biggest corruption scandal uh, that happened here in Chicago and in Cook County. And this is a corruption trial that locked away or locked up more corrupt judges and politicians, even police officers, than any other scandal in the history of our state. Now, the lead federal prosecutor on that trial, or on that, you know, corruption trial, his name is Dan Webb. Uh, Dan Webb is who I've consulted with in creating a commission that is modeled after a commission that was started and executed upon after Operation Greylord. It was called the Solovey Commission, and it was headed up by a former federal prosecutor of the utmost integrity, who then picked 10 members to be part of the Solovey Commission, uh, all of whom were, you know, high levels of integrity, who worked in good government and in the space of, you know, litigation and anti-corruption. So we're going to do the exact same thing. 
and, and I've consulted with Dan. He's been an advisor of mine on this. Um, the minute I take office, we will actually create that commission, and the commission will be charged with creating a report of all of these recommendations of how we can clean up city government. And it's not window dressing. I'm going to then, as mayor, execute as many of those as possible to make sure that we're rooting up corruption and trying to restore some faith in government. The Salvi Commission came forward with a report that had a whole ton of ethics changes that were employed, but pretty much since then we haven't seen much action. I was a little kid back when that happened. The number one thing, though, that needs to change in this city is we have to get rid of aldermanic prerogative. That is the number one reason why aldermen in the city of Chicago primarily end up going to jail. They take advantage of and abuse their very unchecked aldermanic prerogative power. That means that like any time a business owner wants to open up a business, they have to go check with the alderman, right? Uh, if they want a zoning change, they have to go check with the alderman. And if the alderman doesn't, if the alderman want, it, doesn't, alderman doesn't want it, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, dedicated bus lanes, let's talk about that, right? I'm talking about connecting the whole city of Chicago through great transportation networks that work. Um, if you want to do a bit dedicated bus lane in the city of Chicago, let's just pick Ashland Avenue, an express lane there, it's dedicated bus lane. Uh, it doesn't happen. Why? Because aldermanic prerogative gets in the way of, of something that could connect the whole city's transportation grid. And the alderman in one ward will want it, uh, but then the alderman in the adjacent ward won't. And at the end of the day, like, you can't get anything done in the city if aldermen are playing games. But most importantly, when it comes to zoning changes, that's where a lot of money is exchanging hands. A zoning person will feel, or a business owner, in order to get on the good side of the alderman, they feel obligated to have to give contributions, and sometimes that leads to a very quick path to corruption. So this is what we've seen mo more often than not uh, plays into why aldermen get in trouble, because they have this unchecked power that has been been there forever. And they, they don't want to ever vote themselves out of the power, and unfortunately some of this power is codified into law. Um, but if they don't want to vote themselves out of it, then we have to will push to, of course, elect a city council that will run on that issue. And today there's, there's a good number of aldermen that are running on the issue of eliminating aldermanic prerogative. Mm -hmm. You need 26 votes to get it done. I think we can get there. But if we can't, then if state of Illinois doesn't help us with the legislative change, then we'll go to a citizen initiative through referendum. But I will end aldermanic prerogative in the city of Chicago. And that's the first most important way to clean up corruption. A lot of the other stuff is cool. But, and then I will say again, speaking of President Breckwinkle, I talked about this yesterday. She, She's the only candidate yes. who is defending the right to keep aldermanic prerogative, and I just don't think that... Well, what she has said is she, just, she doesn't think it's politically feasible to be able to get rid of it because of what you alluded to before. Yeah, because she's going to The alderman be, had to give it up. Now, you know why? Yeah. Because she's going to be a caretaker mayor. Okay. And you've got to right. you you work, work hard. You've got to work hard to get things done. some other questions so over here. Yes. yes. President, if you could talk a little bit about... Um, hold, hold it until you get the mic. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, I know you have uh, kind of your thoughts on a, for a school board being a, kind of a hybrid between elected and appointed. Could you talk a little bit more about that and why you think that's the best option? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, I think democracy is a good thing. Currently, right now, we don't really have any. It's an entirely um, appointed school board. Um, but I also think that as much as democracy is a good thing, uh, the mayor should be part of that democratic process, right? Like, so the concept that a fully elected school board that does not include the mayor I just don't think is very democratic either. And frankly, as a mother of a child in the CPS system, even if I was not the mayor, I would not want the mayor of the city of Chicago to walk away from accountability and responsibility to the system. So I think that this is a shared partnership that has to happen. I totally invite the voices of parents, of uh, administrators, of teachers, but the mayor at the end of the day needs to be accountable and responsible for the success or the failure of our CPS system. So would the mayor have a certain number of seats on the board? Yeah, I mean, it's just, have, yeah, and that's how most of those work, you know. Do you have a, a formula? Do you have I, a I don't have the formula? magic number yet. I mean, mm -hmm. I would still want to have uh, a greater say than, you know, if, if it was like nine, I'd want five out of four, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you'd always yes, have Yes, but we would definitely vote. have, yeah, that's okay, because the mayor has to have accountability and responsibility okay. for the system. Okay. But I think opening it up to, to voices that are different than mine, uh, opening it up to parents that actually have a stake in the system. And I'll give you an example. Fully elected school boards do not allow undocumented people to be on them. And right now in the city of Chicago, we have a great deal of undocumented students who deserve representation as well. So I could appoint someone to fill that hole in a way that a fully elected school board couldn't. The other thing with elected school boards is that while they may sound good, they haven't necessarily worked out all that great. Look what's happening in LA. The Koch brothers have essentially taken over 
the elected school board and have funneled millions and millions of dollars into electing their representatives, which clearly wouldn't coincide with my views or the views of most parents in Chicago. So sometimes we have to be careful about what we wish for, and I think that having a hybrid school board still allows the mayor to keep um, you know, accountability and responsibility, but would have every day people that are pushing the envelope and forcing you to listen and to make decisions that you'll have to be even more accountable for than before. So I just think it's a reasonable approach. And I say that again, not just as a mayor, but as a mother of a child in the system. I don't want my mayor, whoever she is, right. or he is, <laughs> to, uh, to walk away from that and just wash their hands and just give it up to somebody else. That's what caretaker mayors do. It's okay. not what I will do. We have, yes, and then uh, behind her. Um, so I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, what do you think, or how do you think your perceived association with the Chicago machine has affected your race? will affect your election, um, and what strategies has your campaign been using to battle that perception on the ground? Because I hear it all the time, you knock sure. doors and people are like, oh, they sound cool, but Mike Madigan. Sure, I know. I know, it's one of those things, like I said, it's, uh, you know, when you've been in elected office, and in my case, I mean, think about it, look at my resume. I was a state representative for 10 years. The funny part about it is that I actually r got elected by running against Mike Madigan's candidate. She was the incumbent at the time. So you'll only people say, oh, she's Mike Madigan. Uh, but they don't ever tell you the story that I actually got elected by running against the speaker's candidate, not once but twice. I ran when I was 25 and I lost by 55 votes. It was heartbreaking. And then I ran again. Like the next day I announced my candidacy and I was such a geek. I didn't go on a single date. I was so focused. I was like, I'm going to win this thing and represent the people of first ward, uh, first district. And, uh, and I did, I won the second time running against his candidate again, he doubled down against me, and I won with 55% of the vote. It was a good like four years before we even really talked. So we ended up, you know, coming together on many issues that matter to Illinoisans, and that's the job, it's to figure out how to work with people that maybe you didn't even like in the beginning and get things done, right? So um, after doing that, I went on to become city clerk, and you have, you have to work with all of the elected officials, all 50 aldermen. I think, it, I think that it hasn't just necessarily affected my campaign. I think it's affected anyone who's in elected office that has associations with any elected officials. But, but, but Madigan, is, I mean, Madigan has been the, uh, the object of a lot of yeah, criticism, sure. and particularly around this Burke investigation now. And, and I think well, that's just that's like new. So, I think yeah. Madigan has been vilified over the last... Yeah you know, four years at least, even six years, but isn't with your all the money, association right? Right, 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 but my, here's my point to yeah. that. So Bruce Rauner spent $9 million to beat me when I ran for controller. It was the most expensive statewide race in the country mm -hmm. for an office that most people didn't even know how to pronounce it, right, or what it did. $9 million, every penny of it tied me to Michael Madigan, every penny of it. I still won the election. So, I mean, this has been tried before. People, I think, when they, when they learn about you and they, they find out the story, and most importantly, when I just talk to people and answer their questions, I will say this, like as a woman, I'm speaking to you as a woman now, there will always be people who say that I couldn't get there on my own, that all of my work product meant nothing because it's the boys who are telling me what to do. It's super sexist, but it is what it is. And at the end of the day, I've been very clear, there's only one person in my universe that tells me what to do, and that's my 83-year-old mother. And she is super proud of me, and she is telling me every day to don't listen to any of these bullies, and to go out there and fight for Chicago. And, you know, she's a Mexican immigrant. Like, did you ever think that she'd think that her daughter could be running for mayor someday? But every time people say that I'm other people, and especially the men, are calling the shots for me, it just makes me, like, double down even more on wanting to prove them wrong and just kick their... <laughs> you know what? So it is what it is. We women yeah. have to work twice as hard to even be in the room with the men. And then when you're there, you have to work three times as hard to even be taken seriously. So people are going to say that every day, whether it's Madigan or, you know, it'll be Kyle. Kyle, you must have pulled some strings to get me to speak today. This is how it works. <laughs> uh, but I don't really care. You don't let this stuff bring you down, and you just keep fighting a good fight. So okay. I'm always going to be me, and I hope that people judge me on my merits and not on this goofy, sexist, you know, supposition that women can't do it on their own, and more importantly, that all of my success must be because a man made it happen for me. That's a bunch of crap. Okay, what do you really think? Yeah. We have time for one more. And yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. 
thank you for being here today. Um, under your leadership in the clerk's office, the fines on mm -hmm. uh, a few things, including city stickers, was raised. That has been uh, criticized by some as not being an effective way to raise re I'm a person who stutters. That's okay. Thanks for your patience. Uh, of course. R revenue for the city um, because it's, it's become harder for um, particularly low-income individuals to pay these fines. Okay. Do you agree with those criticisms? Um, if not, why? And if so, have you learned from that experience? Yeah, thank you. That's an awesome question. So. So what happened with the, let me just start from the beginning. Um, when I took over the clerk's office, we were in the middle of a, a really bad financial downturn for the city of Chicago. We were closing libraries and the city just didn't have enough revenues and they had to come up with revenue options to keep things like that open um, and many other things. But long story short, I also walked into a city sticker uh, system where it had existed for 105 years. So the last time, or I should say when it started was 1908. That was the last time the Cubs had won the World Series prior to 2016. So it had been a long time. I took office in 2011. And I'm not kidding you guys. If you would have gone to the clerk's office, there were three to four hour long waits to pay a city sticker, which is essentially a pretty expensive tax. And people would complain about it all the time, but they were kind of just used to this terrible pilgrimage. Where 105 years ago, there was a handful of Ford Model Ts and horses and buggies. It was probably like a cool thing to do to saunter down to City Hall and pay your tax. Uh, but 105 years later, you're talking about 1.3 million vehicles that all have to get a city sticker, and they all come due again in the month of June. I mean, it's impossible to do that efficiently. So I wanted to implode that system and get rid of those three to four hour long waits, make sure that nobody had to lose a day's wages to go stand in a super long line with bad customer service. And that was what motivated me in large part to run for that office. As soon as I got into office, Mayor Emanuel, without consulting with me, decided that he was going to hike up the cost of the city sticker significantly. Most vehicles were going to go from uh, $75 to uh, $135. That's a huge increase, a huge increase. He sold it as a $15 increase to the, most, to the heaviest vehicles, but what he didn't tell the public was that he was recategorizing the weights of vehicles. So like what today would have been and uh, at that time, a $60 or $75 sticker was going to go from $75 to $135, uh, something that was not an SUV, like a Ford Taurus, for example, right? just a passenger vehicle. So he announced this at a budget address without consulting with me, and I'm the one who administers this program, and I didn't take nicely to it. So I fought the mayor in public on it. He was brand new mayor with a ton of, of he was in his honeymoon stage. Everybody loved Ron at the time, and I was just the city clerk who got elected independently of him, right? Mm -hmm. And so I stood up to him and I said, I'm going to fight you on this because this isn't right and there's better ways to secure revenue. And so we looked at how do we avoid that $60 increase hitting so many people in Chicago and what we settled on was a $10 increase across the board and the city sticker fee had not been increased for many, many years so it was reasonable. Um, people didn't so much complain about that but one of the things that we also supported was increasing the cost of the ticket for not buying your city sticker because the ticket was less expensive than the actual city sticker. So there was actually a disincentive. Most people played the odds and said, well, I'll risk getting a ticket uh, because it's cheaper than actually paying the sticker. So from a perspective of if you're looking at this from what's fair, I think you could argue that the ticket price should be more expensive than the sticker to get people to actually buy the sticker. So what we did was that the, this, this, the city supported, and it was a unanimous decision. It's not like this was even controversial at the time. The city council, you mean? Yeah, the city yeah. council, I mean, mm -hmm. what did I say? Mm -hmm. uh, but the city council supported mm -hmm. and passed a piece of legislation that increased the cost of um, the penalties, right, for not being in compliance with the law. Now, that was the end of my involvement there. Our office was not responsible for enforcing those tickets, and it wasn't just that ticket. Like, the city's Department of Revenue enforced all kinds of tickets, and they were really egregious on how they were doing it, but I had no visibility on that because that's not my department. That's the city of Chicago, which is separate from the city clerk's office. So the enforcement division, whether it was the police or the Department of Revenue enforcement agents or the contractors that they hire out to you know, enforce like parking meters or whatever it is that they're giving you a ticket for, and the city sticker itself, um, it looks like based on this WBEZ investigation, which I'm glad that they did it, 
was really disproportionately targeting communities of color. Why? Because they can't hide their cars. They're not parking them in private garages that we don't have access to. So long story short, when they told me those facts, which we didn't have any visibility on, I was of course offended because I would have never been supportive of that. And anyone who knows me knows that. So at the time, this was well before I was thinking about running for mayor, and I said then, that needs to change. They need to fix this, right? Because nobody should be going bankrupt because they can't buy their city sticker or pay for the tickets. Mm -hmm. And it's totally baloney to pretend that you actually have these revenues coming into the city uh, when people can't afford to pay the tickets. We're never going to get that, those dollars back. So why would we allow people to go bankrupt? It's, that's morally corrupt, and it's not what I would have ever supported. So as mayor, I get to fix that. And we're, we've got a whole plan on how we would deal with that. We're going to create amnesty programs, and we'll work with the city clerk's office, which I obviously have a lot of experience doing, in getting people on payment plans, allowing them to pay for their stickers in increments, uh, doing early warning systems when people are uh, perhaps, you know, have one ticket that they can know you got to pay this so that you don't end up getting a boot, right? There's a lot of things that we can do. What about red light cameras? Where, where so red light cameras, I think, should only exist in the most dangerous intersections mm -hmm. in the city of Chicago. So because, you wouldn't eliminate them all, but you would Yeah, I mean, I think we, I, I don't think we should be using red light cameras as a source of revenue mm -hmm. just to stick it to people. Mm -hmm. But I also think that there are plenty of instances where the red light cameras have avoided people from getting killed at very dangerous intersections, and that makes sense there. So again, a reasonable approach to this stuff, and not just gonna pander to people, right? So we have to be reasonable about our approaches that are centered around safety. But again, I'm not gonna pretend that we have like all these receivables and money coming to us when we're never gonna get that money, and we're just hurting people in the process. So our plan will make sure that we are doing this in an equitable way, and that we're allowing people the opportunity to purchase their stickers and be in compliance in a way that works for them, uh, but most importantly, not to be punitive. And you better believe there's no way in hell that I'll support my Department of Revenue from targeting people just because they want to be lazy on how they're doing this. Not going to happen. I get to fix it. That's exciting. I believe you. I yes. believe you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks for all your great questions. This has been an exciting time. Thank you so much for coming and, and talking to uh, and hearing Laura Washington talk to Santa Mendoza. Uh, Laura Washington has literally two more spots left to sign up for office hours at uh, the computer right at the desk. So who, let's see who the lucky person is. We'd love your support. I would love your support. Please don't vote for anybody else but me. <laughs> and volunteer for me and spread the word. If you live in Chicago and you can vote, please exercise your vote. It's really important. And, and I don't really care who you vote for, but I would prefer you vote for me. So. One more, one Just more, vote. I, I need one more thing yes. from you. And that's if, if you get into the runoff, and you know you will, we're going to, we're, IOP is going to host a, a public safety policing forum nice. in the middle of March. Yeah, let's do it. You'll come back. For oh, that. for sure, yeah. With, with whoever Wonder the other. Uh, I promise you right now. Here we go. All right. All right, where's my team? Yeah. We're doing this one. Yeah. All, right, All right, there you go. You and your competitor, whoever that is. Yes. Together.